This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On May the 29th, our Defence and Security Studies program hosted Dr. Andrew McGregor of Aberfoyle International Security in Toronto, who spoke to us about the murky world of Russian influences in Africa. Okay, good evening everybody. Welcome to the uh, Royal Canadian Military Institute, and welcome to the Defense and Security Studies evening program for May. Uh, I'm Dr. Daniel Eustace, and I'm the director of the Defense and Security Studies program, so welcome to you. Uh, we run about eight speaker events a year. Um, we run a conference, which we just did in April, and we publish SITREP. So that's our, that's our job, that's part of our educational role for the Royal Canadian Military Institute. Uh, and it's my, uh, it's my responsibility, but also my pleasure to reach out to experts in the field of defense and security studies. Um, and tonight, I'm really pleased that we were able to convince um, Dr. Andrew McGregor to come back and speak to us again. I think this is the third time or second time? Third or Several kind of things. Several yeah. times. Let's put it this way. Uh, we're always happy to have Andrew because he's a he's he's not only a great speaker but he's a uh, an expert in 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 the field. And we had a chance tonight to have dinner together. And I was asking him about. Uh, I think I just pushed one of your buttons. I'm sorry. That's okay. It's okay. No. It's okay. Did you push one of my buttons? No, no, wrong button. We don't want to do that. No. Don't push Spoiler alert, yeah. end of the Wagner group. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, but, um, but Andrew's resume, if you've seen the, the flyer, I'll, uh, I will read it to you. Um, this is probably the short bio. Uh, so he is the director of the Toronto-based Aberfoyle International Security Organization. And we were chatting at dinner tonight. So Andrew basically is a, is a gun for hire. He's a brain for hire to other organizations around the world uh, who want him to research on particular <coughs> projects. Uh, and, uh, and that's basically how, uh, how his organization works. But he's, he's an expert in so many fields, but he specializes in, in, in uh, uh, near and Middle Eastern civilizations. He specializes in Africa. He received a PhD from the University of Toronto's Department of Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations in 2000, and he's a former research associate of the Canadian Institute of International Affairs. From 2007 to 2014, Andrew was the senior editor of the Global Terrorism Analysis Program of the Washington, D.C.-based Jamestown Foundation. He's the author of A History of Darfur, published by Cambridge University in 2001, and A Military History of Modern Egypt, published by Prager Security International in 2006. And Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have a new book coming out on Sudan? Uh, yes, it uh, should be out uh, fairly soon. It's called African Apocalypse. And Which is uh, going to be a great addition to the literature there, and we're going to do what we can to promote that book for, for Andrew. But he hasn't been idle. He's written over 800 articles on international military and security issues for organizations such as the U.S. Army's Combating Terrorism Center, the Jane's Intelligence, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and the Canadian Institute of Strategic Studies. He also provides frequent commentary on military and security issues for international newspapers, radio and television, including the New York Times, Financial Times, CNN, Fox News, Al Jazeera, the BBC, and unfortunately the CBC. Not for a while. <laughs> but not for a while. <laughs> Uh, tonight's topic is a very interesting one, Russia's New Africa Corps. I'm not going to try to explain that because I'm sure that uh, Dr. Andrew McGregor is going to do that very, very well. So welcome to the RCMI once again. We look forward to hearing from you and we will be inviting you back again yeah. as always and particularly with respect to your new book. Thank you very much, Dan. Appreciate it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out. It's great to see you. Um, last time I was here, I was talking about the Wagner Group. And of course, there's a great deal that's happened in the meantime. 
I'm sure you all recall uh, last June's mutiny by Yevgeny Prigozhin and uh, his Wagner group uh, followers. His so-called march for justice on Moscow, strangely uncontested, was nonetheless a failure. Two months later, a private jet carrying Prigozhin and other Wagner leaders was blown out of the sky northwest of Moscow, killing all aboard. The cause was most likely an internal explosion, possibly a bomb. Vladimir Putin had his own version of events. He suggested that the passengers had been consuming drugs and alcohol and had likely detonated a grenade in their intoxicated state. Ex-Wagner fighters were offered the choice of joining the Russian National Guard, the Ministry of Defense, or a new private military company, PMC Redut. If you're unfamiliar with PMCs, I'll be mentioning that acronym many times. It stands for Private Military Company, which is the modern fancy way of saying mercenaries. The Russian need for manpower to support its invasion of Ukraine had already led to many Wagner members being transferred from Africa to the Ukraine front. Obviously, with the collapse of Wagner, something had to be done to restructure Russian operations in Africa, which is what I'll be focusing on tonight. Russian interest in Africa intensified after sanctions began to be imposed on Russia following the 2014 annexation of Crimea. Russia is now taking advantage of a recent wave of military coups in Africa, including those in Niger, Burkina Faso, Gabon, Guinea, Mali, and Sudan. There have also been failed coup attempts in Guinea-Bissau, the Gambia, and the island nation of Sao Tome and Principe. Many of these coups have come in Francophone states, their leaders citing a rejection of French neocolonialism as motivation, and have been followed by popular protests denouncing the West and welcoming Russia. Mm. The pattern reflects months or often years of intense media manipulation and influence efforts to pave the way for authoritarian and pro-Russian regimes. After 10 years of warfare, France and the regimes supported in Africa failed to defeat the jihadists plaguing the region. Along the way, France picked up a reputation for defending regimes known for corruption, nepotism, and fraudulent elections. Fertile ground was thus provided for Russian influence operations. Russia still has no military base in Africa, but is actively seeking a Red Sea port in Sudan and it sought permission to establish bases in Egypt, Eritrea, Madagascar, Mauritania, Mozambique, and the Central African Republic. At the moment, only the latter seems realistic. Moscow also has military security cooperation agreements with some 40 African states, but these are varying degrees of significance, uh, ranging from the serious to the not so serious. So let's step back for a moment and look at what I might describe as the Soviet origin of Russia's current political offensive in Africa. Posters in the 60s were a principal means of delivering the Russian message to Africa. The works include lots of broken chains and muscular black African men and women ready to avenge themselves on a stream of cowardly colonialists. They employed popular slogans such as, the wind of freedom is blowing over Africa. The nations of Africa will reign in colonizers. Africa is building, Africa will win. This one, the chains are breaking. This is an echo of our revolution. And you'll notice up in the top left-hand corner, we have an image from the early days of the revolution and superimposed on it this modern image of Africans carrying on the tradition of communist Marxist revolution. Many posters, poster artists drew these parallels between the October Revolution in Russia and the liberation movement in Africa. 
For example, this 1969 poster shows a young black man with a rifle illuminate, illuminated by the light of the Soviet cruiser Aurora. Aurora, of course, fired the first shot in the 1917 October Revolution and became one of the main symbols of the revolution. The great Lenin has illuminated our path, reads the inscription. So coming up to the present day, building on the old Soviet methods, Russia today exploits the postmodernist ideologies that have conquered academia in the West. <coughs> and the current neo-Marxist infatuation with decolonization. The slogans have changed since the Cold War. References to Lenin and other icons of communism have disappeared. But most importantly, the delivery system has been completely overhauled. Social media is the new tool, and its agents are pro-Russian influencers, such as Kemi Seba and Natalie Yam who are seen here. Kami Seba is a very interesting character. He's got all kinds of ideas about uh, changing Africa and destroying Europe. And one of his uh, principal ideas is actually restoring ancient Af African religion, uh, which he thinks is more authentic for Africans than Christianity or even Islam. A recent propaganda effort from Russia was formed last September, known as the African Initiative. The new Russian news agency focuses on, quote, the neo-colonial legacy that African countries have been struggling with for decades. Its leading personality is Viktor Lukavenko, formerly known as Viktor Vasilyev. Lukavenko spent five years in prison for beating a Swiss national to death before serving in the Wagner Group. You can see him on the left there when he was still in prison with one of his gangster pals. Lukavenko now travels across insecure regions of Africa, meeting with pro-Russian influencers like Kimi Seba, who you can see on the right again. And he's even quoted in Russian media as an expert on West Africa. Return to what to do about Wagner. Part of Moscow's solution to the Wagner problem has been to place all former Wagner operations and personnel in Africa under the direct command of the GRU. The GRU, of course, is Russia's military intelligence agency. Unlike other security agencies in Russia that report to the president's office, the GRU reports to the Ministry of Defense and the chief of the general staff. Moscow promised Russia-friendly nations in Africa that the demise of the Wagner Group would not interfere with their continued support. This pledge was confirmed when the Africa Corps, a special structure of the Ministry of Defense, was created last November 22nd. Full activation of the new force is scheduled for this summer, with operations in Niger, Mali, Libya, Burkina Faso, and the Central African Republic. Ideally, for the Corps, this is just a start. The Africa Corps will use GRU facilities and bases, support and transport from the Ministry of Defense, and will re report directly to GRU overseers. To shift from the Wagner Group to the GRU-controlled Africa Corps represents a loss to Moscow's plausible deniability for the actions of Russian troops in Africa. The Africa Corps will be subject to international scrutiny in a way that the Wagner Group never was. Adapting the intertwined Wagner model of business, self-promotion, military activity and plausible deniability will not be easy. A major problem for the GRU, which of course is not a business enterprise, will be to sort out the intricate web of companies making money for prudent, friendly businessmen through Wagner protection and to somehow to keep these people happy and prosperous. So let's look at the leadership of this Africa Corps. Some new faces here, uh, people that have been very, uh, that have been around for a very long time, they're very experienced and many of them very capable. 
the best example of these is uh, Colonel General Yunus Bek Yavkurov. He's a Muslim English, I'll explain that in a minute, from no Russia's North Caucasus region, and the current Russian Deputy Minister of Defense. Possessing diplomatic, administrative, and military skills, Yakurov has served the Soviet Union and the Russian Federation as a soldier in Abkhazia, Azerbaijan, North Ossetia, Chechnya, <coughs> English Chechnya, and other parts of the North Caucasus. As a former Soviet officer, Yakurov remains an advocate of official secularism, which he does not see as being in conflict with Islamic observance. Most of the nations in which the Africa Corps will operate are majority Muslim, making him an ideal point man. At the end of August and September, Yakurov visited Libya, Burkina Faso, Mali, and the Central African Republic, assuring their leaders that the death of the Wagner leadership would not alter Russia's commitment to them. This map shows the nations of the Northern Caucasus, actually I should say the republics, uh, all part of the Russian Federation. Uh, the English, who are of course from English Chechnya, who you will see in about the middle of that map, uh, beside Chechnya, just to the left of it in dark green, uh, the smallest uh, republic on that map. Uh, the English and the Chechens are both part of the Vinak people. They're closely related, their languages are similar. What happened, um, well, both nations were deported during World War II and did not return until Stalin's death. They were deported to Central Asia. English Chechnya and Chechnya formed a single republic in the old Soviet Union until 1991 when the Union collapsed. English Chechnya opted to remain part of the new Russian Federation, while the Chechens opted to try for independence. Yakurov made his reputation in 1999 while serving with the Russian peacekeeping mission in Bosnia. Russian troops there were part of the NATO-led stabilization force. As a GRU Special Forces major, Yakurov led a team of 18 GRU commandos to Kosovo in May 1999 in a secret operation designed to pave the way for the Russian seizure of the Serbian-led Pristina Air Base just ahead of the arrival of the NATO column. Once Yevkurov established the way, a small Russian force of armored personnel carriers and 200 paratroopers raced over 300 miles of mountainous country in Bosnia and Kosovo, arriving at Pristina only hours ahead of unsuspecting NATO troops who were astonished to find the base already in Russian hands. A clash seemed imminent with potential for a major war, but was avoided when British Lieutenant General Mike Jackson disobeyed, disobeyed an order from American NATO Commander General Wesley Clark to use force to expel the Russian troops. Yet Kurov's daring operation revived the demoralized Russian army and signaled NATO that post-Soviet Russia was still a force in Europe. Yevkurov was given the title of Hero of the Russian Federation. After serving with distinction in the Second Chechen War, Yevkurov was appointed president of his English Chechen home in 2008 for a five-year term. It was a mission rather than a reward. English Chechen was at that time, the most violent region of the Russian Federation, beset by criminal gangs, religious extremists, and tribal blood feuds, all taking advantage of a mountainous landscape to avoid elimination. Restoring order to this violent chaos was Yevkurov's task. As he said later, for five years I woke up in the morning, picked up a machine gun, and went to fight. However, he also used negotiation and a deep knowledge of English traditions and religion to quell the violence. Unfortunately, his efforts did not please everyone. During a wave of assassinations, Yevkurov 
was himself targeted by a suicide bomber in 2009. A car packed with explosives blew up beside the presidential Mercedes, inflicting severe damage to Yevkurov's skull, lungs, and liver, giving him as well two fractured ribs and severe burns on his face. Demonstrating enormous strength, Yakurov was back at work in less than three months. He eventually stepped down after his resolution of a border dispute with Chechnya created an overwhelming opposition. To bring us back to the Wagners. After the Wagner mutineers took the Russian city of Rostov on dawn in June 2023, Yakurov and General Vladimir Alexeyev were taken prisoner by Prigozhin. You can see them there, uh, Yevkurov on the left, Prigozhin in the middle, and Alexeyev on the right, looking somewhat bemused at uh, this not very non-military, pudgy mutineer. <clears throat> An uncomfortable conversation at this meeting was recorded with the Wagner leader complaining Russia's military leaders were getting his guys into a meat grinder and declaring his intention to get Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu and the Chief of Defense, or Chief of the General Staff, Valery Gerasimov. However, Prigozhin was not taken seriously by this pair of senior officers and was eventually reduced to complaining that Yevkurov kept addressing him with the informal T the mm. Russian version of two in, in French, rather than the form of V, the equivalent of the French VU, thus implying Prigozhin's inferiority. So the transcript is actually quite amusing. After Prigozhin's finished doing all his bragging about what he's going to do, he's effectively just put down uh, to the point that he can't think of anything else except the insults that he's suffering from uh, Yevkurov especially. Second man in uh, the AFCOR leadership is Lieutenant General Vladimir Alexeyev, who we've just seen in the previous shot. He's the first deputy chief of the GRU. He's an ethnic Ukrainian. Mm. He's been accused of the, by the U.S. of organizing cyber attacks during the 2016 presidential election and again in 2020. Alexeyev was made a hero of the Russian Federation for his work in Syria. He's heavily involved in organizing Russia's network of PMCs. Here we have Major General Andrei Avryanov, who heads military unit 29155 of the GRU. A suitably obscure title for what they do. Avryanov has combat experience in Afghanistan and Chechnya. He's suspected of engineering an attack on art stores in Chechnya. In 2014, they killed two people. The ammunition was allegedly on its way to Ukraine. Of course, this is at the time, of the beginning of the conflict in Ukraine and the seizure of Crimea. The two GRU agents believed to have carried out the operation were also thought to have carried out the assassination by nerve agent of Russian double agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter in the UK four years later. <clears throat> Unit 29155 is also alleged to have been involved in poisonings of arms manufacturers in Bulgaria, the takeover and annexation of Crimea, the failed 2016 coup in Montenegro designed to prevent that nation from joining NATO, and deep stabilization operations in Moldova in 2014 and Catalonia in 2017. Avriana was later accused of being part of the plot to assassinate Prigozhin and other Wagner leaders under the direction of National Security Council leader Nikolai Patrushev. Avriana will supply Moscow friendly authoritarian regimes in Africa with security, repression of dissidents, and even assassinations if necessary. Here we have a recruiting poster for the Africa Corps. Wagner was a bit show showy to say the least. 
with their flashy recruiting posters, well, uh, self-produced movies about their exploits in Africa, and a succession of statues featuring, featuring idealized Wagner heroes in Ukraine, Syria, and Africa. The GRU, by nature secretive and discreet, is unlikely to preserve this style. Despite the new formation's name, the neo-Nazi flags, imagery and tattoos so common to Wagner personnel may be discouraged in the new Africa Corps. Recruitment for the Corps started on December 20th, 2023. Potential recruits are promised that the new formation will this time be led by experienced and competent commanders, many of them from elite Russian units. High salaries, roughly $2,500 US per month, Medical care and compensation for the families of casualties are all part of the package. By comparison, Russian soldiers make about $1,800 a month, roughly three times that of the average Russian worker. Like Wagner, the Africa Corps may rely on local recruits in Africa to fill out its numbers at a time when Russian manpower is at a premium. Troops currently serving in Ukraine are not eligible to serve in the Africa Corps. Here we have another uh, example of recruiting poster. The text here is a bit blurry, but it seems to be offering recruits the opportunity to wear extremely hot clothing in the middle of the desert. <laughs> Russia has not abandoned Wagner-style mercenary groups entirely. And has actually created two new PMCs to continue the type of work performed by Wagner, though this time with closer ties to the GRU and the Ministry of Defense. No single PMC will be allowed in future to assume the strength of Wagner. The first PMC, Redu, is thought to be the creation of GRU General Vladimir Alexeyev. Founded in 2021, members are paid directly by the Russian Ministry of Defense. Commanded by Konstantin Merzayans, Redu is actually something of an umbrella group, incorporating as many as 20 armed Russian formations, including the Union of Cossack Warriors, Imperial Russian Formations, and the Union of Donbass Volunteers. The other main PMC that has been created is PMC Convoy. This was founded in Crimea in 2022 as the Wagner Group began to slip from the control of the Russian defense establishment. Convoy was launched by Sergei Aksyonov, the head of the Russian-backed administration of Crimea. And you can see him down there at the bottom left. Before his appointment by President Putin, Aksyonov, was involved in gang activity in Crimea under the nickname Goblin. Operational control is under Konstantin uh, Pikalov, call sign Maze, who has been described as Prigozhin's former right-hand man with a history of activity in Madagascar and the Central Act African Republic. Pikalov is a former serviceman and a one-time private detective, once under suspicion for money laundering. He's pictured here on the bottom right with Madagascar's president, who is never far from Pikalov, who became his close bodyguard and advisor. Pikalov is thought to be tied to the murder of three Russian journalists investigating Wagner activities in the Central African Republic in 2018. He was cited in UK sanctions for the torture and targeting of civilians in that country. Convoys reputed to operate in Crimea and the Kherson region of Ukraine. As with Redu, recruits signed two contracts, one with Convoy and one with the Russian Ministry of Defense. Convoy and Redu are financed by two of Putin's friends, Gennady Timchenko and Arkady Rottenberg.
Now, as I start to go into a uh, look at the regional uh, implications of this change, uh, we've got a map here of the Sahel countries of Africa. If you're not familiar with that term, the Sahel uh, is the transitional band of Africa, uh, south of the arid region of the north and uh, north of the southern, more fertile regions of Africa. It has also become a tremendous band of insecurity. Uh, in this photo here, we have Burkina Faso's interim president, Captain Ibrahim Traore, who took over in a 2022 coup. And he's having a nice little fist bump here with Yakurov. Uh, that appears to be the Red Duke commander, uh, Konstantin Merzayans, in the background. The new military regimes of Maui, Niger, and Burkina Faso announced their withdrawal from the West African regional body ECOWAS last January and created a new alliance of Sahel states. The alliance states have welcomed Russian troops. A new joint counterterrorism force was formed in March after regional insecurity actually increased after the military takeovers. Despite the participation of Russian troops, conflict fatalities have actually increased 38% since the expulsion of French and other Western forces. In Niger, the Pentagon recently confirmed a full withdrawal of its 1,000 troops by September, opening the door to even closer relations between Niger and Moscow. The French military withdrawal was completed last December. Niger's French-run uranium industry helps power the many reactors in France, though Paris has begun looking for other sources, fearing the worst. Russia, whose own uranium production currently exceeds domestic demand, does not have to seek a full takeover of the industry in Niger. Being in a position to influence the direction and quantity of exports will be sufficient to help apply pressure on Western Europe, much like Moscow did uh, previously to the war in Ukraine and still does with its exports of oil and national gas. We have here uh, on the left, Mohammed Idris Debi, who took power in a coup three years ago in Chad, and has just completed the so-called democratic transition by being elected president last week. His father, Idris Debi Idno, closely allied to the French, took power in a 1991 coup before serving as president for 30 years, despite repeated rebellions, often led by his relatives. This was exactly the kind of situation that Russia could exploit. And there were accusations that Wagner personnel in Libya trained <coughs> the Chadian rebels who crossed into Chad from further allegations of Russians training other Chadian rebel groups in the Central African Republic. Despite this, the new president, who seems to have put on a bit of weight since uh, he took over three years ago, mm. has signaled a greater openness to a Russian presence there's growing pressure from the opposition and civil society groups to expel the remaining French garrison in Chad. U.S. troops in Chad are also in the process of pulling out. There was a report in April that 100, uh, sorry, 100 Russian troops had arrived in the Chadian capital, but it turned out to be Hungarian troops instead. Hungary is, seems to be making its own play in Chad something they've been building up to for several years uh, without really anybody noticing. Nonetheless, Chad, with its own powerful military and strategic location, represents a powerful prize for Russia. Now, if you look at the map there, you can <coughs> see why. We have Libya to the north with a Russian presence, Niger to the west with a Russian presence, Sudan to the east with a Russian presence, <coughs> Pardon me, and the Sudan, uh, Central African Republic to the south with a Russian presence. Chad would be a keystone in forming a solid block in this very strategic and mineral rich area. <clears throat> Russia's participating 
as we speak in military operations in Sahel in Africa. They're fighting the Islamic State and other jihadist groups, all of whom post regular claims of Russian deaths. They have not had a great deal of, of success. There's been military failure in counterterrorism operations and far too many reports of massacres of civilians. Ivan Maslow, the head of the Wagner Group's operations in Mali, is accused of overseeing the group's involvement alongside Malian troops in the Mura massacre of 500 people in 2022, including summary executions, rape, and torture. Uh, three of these photos on the left were supplied by the Islamic State. Libya, yes, Libya is quite familiar with Africa Corps, having hosted one in the past. You have here a picture of Yevkurov with the Libyan National Army Commander Khalifa Haftar in Benghazi. Khalifa Haftar is the effective leader of at least half of Libya. Uh, he is technically the leader of the military wing of the House of Representatives government in Benghazi, but in reality the House of Representatives is the political wing of his army. The Russian military record in Africa, as I've been saying, is not brilliant. In its 2019 intervention against jihadists in northern Mozambique, resulting in significant losses, and a number of Russians were beheaded before a Russian withdrawal. Russian assistance likewise did not help Field Marshal Haftar here take Tripoli in 2019. Russian casualties were heavy, and their operations were followed by accusations of war crimes. Um, their reputation is badly damaged by the many booby traps they left behind in Tripoli's suburbs which wound up killing returning civilians to their homes. Russia now has use of Libyan National Army controlled air bases at Al Jufra, Sirta, and Al Khatim. Of these, Al Jufra is the most important. On the map there, you can see the Jufra region, almost smack in the center of Libya. Uh, the air base is to the top right of that region, sorry, the top left. It's, uh, it's very close. Um, it's right in the midst of Libya's substantial oil fields. Al Jufra now holds 14 MiG-29 fighter jets and a number of Sukhoi-24 bombers, all protected by Russian Pantsir air defense systems. The MiG-29 that you see here has Libyan insignia. Sudan. Wagner has a mixed record in Sudan, one of Africa's most politically unsettled nations with 17 attempted coups, six of them successful since independence in 1956. In 2017, gold mining concessions were offered by the military Islamist regime of Omar al-Bashir in exchange for arms and security assistance. Russia, through Wagner and its subsidiaries, it succeeded in extracting $2.5 billion in gold from Africa in the last two years alone, a most useful and sanctions-resistant contribution to funding Putin's expensive war in Ukraine. Much of this has come from Sudan. Two Russian mining companies operating in Sudan, M Invest and Meraway Gold, are under international sanctions. Both are involved in illicit gold exports to help fund Russia's war in Ukraine as well as disinformation campaigns and arms imports. Russia's other objective in Sudan is the establishment of a naval port on the Red Sea. But its support of the rebel rapid support forces against the government's armed forces has made this goal more distant. Ukrainian special forces are believed to be operating in Sudan in support of the Sudanese armed forces, the government allied armed forces, <laughs> against the Wagner-supported RSF. Russia's Africa Corps will require new direction from the Russian Foreign Ministry before it begins its operations in Sudan. Uh, there was news about that just today. 
it looks like Russia has decided that it is going to change its uh, support from the RSF, the rebel RSF, uh, to the Sudanese uh, armed forces, which of course co control Port Sudan, which is where they'd like to put their port, and the RSF has no presence there at all. And what we need to avoid, avoid is impressions like the one given here on this map that suggests a Russian takeover of Africa is pretty much a fait accompli with all those nice areas in red supposedly under the Russian thumb already. What I don't want to give is the impression that the growing Russian presence in Africa is either overwhelming or irreversible. Moscow is taking advantage of a general lack of interest in Africa in the West, typified by Donald Trump's characterization of African nations as shithole countries of no interest. Russia has a weak economy and a GDP only slightly greater than Canada's. African imports from Russia represent less than 2% of Africa's total, while African exports to Russia are less than 1% of the total received. Russia contributes less than 1% of foreign direct investment in Africa. With a diversion of most military resources to the ill-considered conquest of Ukraine, Russia's presence in Africa is vulnerable to Western pushback should the West overcome its own internal ideological and political objections. I'll give the example of the Central African Republic. The last French legionnaires left two years ago leaving a barely governed country in the hands of Wagner mercenaries and their business associates. Though President uh, Faustin Arkhanj Twader initially relied on Russian fighters to resist various rebel movements and provide his personal security, he appears to have eventually realized that his nation had become a Wagner colony with even mandatory Russian language instruction in CAR schools. Twader has since explored the a possibility of inviting an American PMC to balance Russian influence and is even considering restoring some degree of relations with France. Moscow will benefit most not from eliminating instability in Africa but from preserving it. Instability in Africa allows the weaponization of migrant flows to Europe and threatens supply chains based on African sources of fuel, minerals, and metals vital to technology and development in Europe and other parts of the Western world. Instability maintains a reliable demand for arms sales or swaps for mineral resources. Russian interests are thus enriched, while Africans are denied financial benefits from their resources. Russia does not require a full-scale colonization of African states to impose its will in the West. It only needs the kind of influence it can obtain through regime preservation, military reliance, and other measures generally within its capabilities as a major arms producer and skilled information manipulator. <coughs> Russia's efforts to become the dominant foreign player in Africa will eventually run up against its own economic weakness. Militarily, it cannot simultaneously pursue a more aggressive strategy in Europe while committing greater forces to Africa. Diplomatically, it will have to cope with growing competition from Turkey, China, and United Arab Emirates, all of whom have their own interests in Africa. Locally, it will be necessary to avoid the kind of abuses and atrocities that could permanently alienate regional bodies such as ECOWAS and the African Union. Russia has been by far the largest supplier of arms to Africa, although Algeria and Africa are the main destinations. But both these nations are currently seeking to diversify their supply with Russian manufacturing unable to supply both the war in Ukraine and fulfill its overseas contracts. At this point, Russia is even seeking to buy back certain types of equipment from its clients, like jet engines. 
Improving battlefield performance will be a priority for the Africa Corps leadership. So far, Russian fighters have not proven any more effective in eliminating Sahelian terrorist formations than their French predecessors. On this file, the clock is ticking. Despite the public shows of support for Russia, there will always be many Africans who do not desire any foreign presence in their countries. All the current waving of Russian flags and pro-Russian slogans could easily disappear if Russian troops are unable to squash deeply entrenched rebels and jihadists. If their role comes to be viewed as one that consists primarily of defending incapable and unpopular military regimes, the Russian experiment in Africa may come to a humiliating end. Thank you very much. Absolutely. So Andrew's willing to take some questions. Please. Yes, sir. I spent some time in Africa over the years, and one of the one of the concerns that was raised on um, some of my trips was not just Russia's involvement, but China's involvement in Africa. Mm -hmm. Like you go to many uh, African uh, cities, and the big soccer stadium is something that has been built by China. So I'm just wondering what your interplay between Russia uh, presence is China's presence presence diminished, and you know, where are we going? Yeah, uh, that's a great point to bring up. Uh, China has taken an entirely different tack in its uh, relations with Africa. As you mentioned, development projects um, on the top of the list. Uh, their interest in Africa has so far been mainly economic. They have um, had very limited military presence. I think they sent a few peacekeepers to Darfur about 10 years ago. And that's about the last I heard of any of that kind of thing. Um, they are trying to use their immense uh, economic power to exercise their own influence in Africa and um, try to make uh, many parts of Africa part of the new um, initiative, the the Silk Road uh, initiative. Um, so yes, a totally different approach that China is taking, but at the same time, uh, they're in competition with Russia, and uh, I think actually uh, China is mo much more likely to still be there after the Russians are gone. Yes, and then yes. In uh, September of 2016, I was in Victoria Falls, Zimbabwe, in the airport to make a connecting flight to Johannesburg. The airport was swarming with Russians, mm -hmm. and there was a handful of Chinese there. And there was one Russian man there who was in charge of everything, and the locals and Mauryans were just following his orders. <laughs> well, that's interesting to hear. Uh, Zimbabwe is certainly in a tight spot and probably looking for any help they can get. Uh, the problem might be uh, whether anyone wants to get involved with Zimbabwe at the, at the moment. Please. Uh, I think there's an interesting situation that one of the main Niger air bases where the Russians are on one side and the Americans are on the other is the Americans depart and the Russians are coming in. I think there's a there must be an interesting situation as they share that air base together at the moment. Uh, my question though was, um, do you see with Shoigu going and Belosov coming in, and I'm taking your lead here that if this is now becoming mainly a GRU operation, the GRU is linked to the Defence Ministry, with Belosov obviously you know being well held as this economist that's coming in, he's taking over the Defence Ministry to build the Russian war economy because that's going to be the big part of how they're obviously going to. Uh, run the rest of their, their war in Ukraine and everything else they're up to. I'm curious to know whether you think there will be a more organized approach to using resource extraction or the other things that perhaps uh, the Wagner Group run were up to, particularly because Rogozin was basically trading off resource extraction to then his own business interests and paying it. That sort of goes back to the Russian state as opposed to being part of a mercenary group. I'm just wondering you might see that work. Oh, you're quite right. Uh, it will be a more focused approach. Uh, less, uh, less making individuals rich um, and making sure that the resources go where they're needed. And as you pointed out, the changes in the Russian Defense Ministry reflect that kind of thing. Here. Um, can't film myself, but that's okay. Um, Andrew, I have because my memory goes back to 1968 and Cold War One, 
I have serious problems taking any of this seriously. Um, so the Russians are messing around in uh, Africa, and as you say, there was that big red splot over the map. But does it mean anything? And the Chinese likewise, the Chinese may be able to target it better, but Russia and China are both a very long way from Africa, and in Cold War I, it was a game of who bribes whom, with no benefit to anybody, uh, and certainly no, no detriment to the Western powers. And I'm going, why do we care? Well, uh, you have a telephone in your hand. Most of the parts uh, elements in that phone uh, come from the region I'm talking about. <coughs> Uh, this is a region that's extremely important um, for technology. Uh, there are many um, elements and minerals and uh, rare earths that are only found in these regions. Uh, as I say, Russia will not necessarily need to control all of this. Um, they have enough rare earths and uranium themselves. They don't need to start taking things over and shipping it all back to Russia. But what they will want to do is start to try to have some kind of control over who's able to purchase this and when. Um, that gives them influence, uh, if, if not direct power, but certainly the kind of influence that they've already demonstrated uh, through their natural gas supplies to Europe. Um, but my response to that is that, yeah, they might catch us with our trousers around our knees, but in about five minutes, uh, the companies that are suffering will force Washington to take measures. But can they? Uh, one of the points I was trying to make in this talk is that the current political ideologies in the West are not in favor of any kind of direct military intervention. It's going to be very difficult to swing uh, the West around to any kind of um, efforts that might be perceived even as a recolonization of Africa. But that's because we're not hurting enough. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, uh, you, you might be right, but uh, politically it will be extremely difficult in the short to medium term to convince people that a direct military occupation of Africa is what's needed to make the West succeed. I'm not talking about occupation. I'm just talking about making it work. Excellent discussion on a topic I, I knew nothing about. Like it's, 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 you know, it doesn't make the mainstream media. My question is, I look at uh, France in um, Indochina, post-1945 to 1954 at the NBN food. I look at North Vietnam, South Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, that whole area there. The French left and it was a mess. I notice this looks like post-colonial post French Africa as a mess and then like all we want all we want is trade with that region based on what you've said so we can have our cell phones so if we get what we want through trade do we really care if they're in bed with the russians well it's if the russians are influencing what kind of trade occurs in the direction and, and quantity of that trade uh it gives them uh, not not control of the west but it gives them influence over uh, nations in the West and at least some part of their um, uh, political strategy. And it's not only trade that's important here. Uh, Russia is very eager to control uh, migration flows north. Mm -hmm. And control of the Sahel regions gives them control of migrant flows. And if, for example, uh, you have that access right through from Central Africa uh, uh, through Chad, up into Libya, and through Sudan. These, these are the major uh, flows of migrants who pass through these countries. Now you have something that Europe is sincerely worried about. So and they're going to have to deal with it. It's not, the migrants don't control migration. No. Migration is controlled by the refusal of European countries to use their navy to solve this problem. And that, again, is what I'm talking about. There is a weakness in the West that will not assist um, the solutions to these problems in, in the short to medium term. Thank you.
And that is um, the method that China is using, is to create their own economic influence uh, rather than a perhaps short-sighted attempt at military influence that Russia is taking. And yes, um, that gives China a tremendous advantage. Uh, yes and then yes. Uh, so, so I'm going to go to uh, Iraq for the third time. The sneaky Russians have been involved every time I've been there. Um, but I'm just wondering, have you seen any evidence of like Wagner expanding into that space? Because it, it's always been like low level and just I, you know, in Iraq. In Iraq. It's like a dagger. Uh, not just Iraq, like the, the Middle East, but I know you're talking about Africa. But um, I'm just wondering peripherally if you've seen any Middle East action specifically with like Wagner or other PMCs. Uh, well, of course, and, and Wagner's on its way out, there will be a different kind of reorganization uh, of um, those elements in the Middle East than the ones I'm talking about more specifically in Africa. Uh, but they, Russian, Russia will be expected to keep a very strong presence in Syria, and uh, you might know more about the cloak and dagger presence of Russians in Iraq than I do. Uh, but uh, uh, it's... it's you know, these kind of operations that Russia is known for and will be expected to continue so far as they see any kind of advantage to themselves. And certainly a presence in the Middle East uh, does help them quite a bit internationally. Sir, sure. yeah, just a point about why I care about Africa and also to echo Catherine's point. I was born in Zambia. I grew up uh, not for very long, but in the Copper Belt. Most of those mines closed in the 70s and 80s because they were uneconomic. The Chinese have gone in and reopened most of those mines, are extracting metals like copper because those are, that, that has now become one of the most important metals in the world. If you want validation of that, the biggest mining deal that's going on at the moment, BJP, buying Anglo-American, not for the diamonds, they're getting rid of that bit because they want the copper. So that, if you want to know what's important in Africa, those sorts of minerals are going to be the sort of things which the Chinese have got a very firm grip on now in Africa. And the West, we have just walked away basically from the continent for your presentation. You know, I've heard some other examples of the similar things in other parts of Africa where um, you know the gemstone mines are shifting into uh, more useful minerals and, and doing it more successfully, um, you know, especially in the Congo. Uh, some of the diamond mines have been closed and turned over to copper like you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, may I ask you, one of the aspects that we have haven't discussed is disinformation. Yes. And when we see what happened on October the 7th um, in Palestine, Israel, however you, however you want to describe it, and we hear numbers like 15, 10, 20,000 to us, they seem terrible. But if you go back and look at the activities that we participated in through NATO and being part of and the United States, the West the number of people who were killed in Iraq and Syria, hundreds of thousands. And why is this disinformation so effective? Obviously, it's coming from several different components. I'll say Iran is one, which is another. 
which I may be partly in. So what, what, is, what is holding us back from providing parallels or comparatives that don't make it that we're, if we support one part or not another? This disinformation seems really powerful to me. Okay, I am um, not sure about all these different types of different disinformation uh, so far as they relate to Palestine and the conflict in Gaza. So a bit outside of uh, what I'm working on tonight. Um, I suppose all nations participate in their own manipulation of information so far as it can be to their advantage. Um, offering such services to countries as a method of gaining influence is certainly something different and that's what the um, certain uh, Russian PMCs are doing. Uh, this is basically um, a service that they're providing. And I'm not so, so sure that uh, Canada, for example, offers disinformation services uh, to other nations. I'm not pretending that we're not so far Thank you. Two more questions if there are any. Yes, please. Speaking of disinformation, what could Can be. Can you speak up loudly, please? Okay. Speaking of disinformation, what could be some of the reasons why Western mainstream media hasn't? Topic well, not being a member of what's mainstream media, it's hard for me to answer. Um, if I could uh, create a newspaper based on my own interests, it would not resemble most of the papers that are available out there. Um, uh, I agree that there's a, really a need for a greater examination of international affairs um, to give people a greater understanding of what's going on. Uh, we've seen you know, it, long before uh, the media, especially newspapers, began to suffer financially, they had already decided to get rid of foreign correspondence uh, in most of the Western media and reliance on uh, a handful of news agencies. And I can tell you the news agencies produce this kind of information, but it is up, then up to the newspapers, the radio and TV and other forms of media to actually use these stories. and. When they're not picked up, then um, this coverage suffers because the agencies such as Reuters or Deutsche Welle or whoever uh, begin to see no financial incentive to keep providing this kind of coverage. So it's, you know, it comes down to money ultimately and what the media thinks will sell. And if they think you want to hear more about uh, provincial politics than what's going on in Central Africa, you're going to get provincial politics. Uh, last question, if there is one. Right. Let's give a round of applause to Andrew. <laughs>